So it's my pleasure, real pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Carol Shaver-Koros, and her credentials are really impressive. She's Professor Emeritus of English History and Founding Dean of the School of Visual Performing Arts at Kane University. And she taught world literature, Asian literature, women's history, Spanish and American literature. She's a PhD in Spanish language and literature from the University of Pennsylvania, has published a text on world literature, has scholarly articles on Gwendolyn Brooks, Edith Wharton, and Edgar Allan Poe. She served for 13 years as treasurer of the Poe Studies Association, as a member of the editorial board of the Edgar Allan Poe Review. She's a real expert. She's also treasurer of the Genealogical Society of Westfields and a trustee of the Westfield Historical Society. It is absolutely a tremendous honor to introduce this heavyweight, Carol Schaefer Koros. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to dedicate this uh, presentation to the late Peter Letterman, who was a friend of mine and introduced me to the old guard. So I'm going to get that on. So, just a sec. <clears throat> There it is. Oops, there it is. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we, we can. Okay, great. I'm sure that many of you, when you were young, were young, listened to or read short stories, very scary ones by Edgar Allan Poe around Halloween. Maybe you heard Poe's short stories like The Telltale Heart, The Black Cat, or The Fall of the House of Usher. I remember that my sister and I and other neighborhood kids loved to scare ourselves reading these tales by flashlight. Growing up, we were told the author, Edgar Allan Poe, was a drug addict and an alcoholic who led a very degenerate life that caused his early death. Next one, please. Perhaps you also heard the Lord's stories about Poe. They were largely based on an infamous obituary written by a trusted friend of Poe's, Rufus Griswold. Before getting into the actual details of that death, I'd like to give you some background on the tragic life that Poe experienced from early childhood. Edgar Poe was the second son after William Henry, usually called Henry, born to two traveling actors, David and Elizabeth Poe. Next slide. He was born on January 19, 1809. Edgar was always proud of his Irish heritage and his Poe grandfather's service in the American Revolution. A word about his mother's first name. Scholars and even Poe's biographer, Kenneth Silverman, mistakenly read the reports of her name as Eliza. But anyone who has done genealogical research knows that Eliza is an abbreviation for Elizabeth, just as GEO stands for George. Elizabeth was very popular from age nine as she was a graceful dancer, had a wonderful memory and beautiful singing voice. David Poe, on the other hand, kept fluffing or mumbling his lines and suffered from stage fright. He was also an alcoholic. When Elizabeth was expecting Edgar's sister Rosalie, David Poe deserted the family, leaving them to struggle in poverty. Elizabeth fell ill but continued to act, ending her career and life in Richmond, Virginia. Edgar was only three years old when she died of tuberculosis on December 8th. Elizabeth left a small painting she had made of Boston to Edgar with the note, quote, for my little son Edgar, who should ever love Boston, the place of his birth, and where his mother found her best and most sympathetic friends, end quote. But as I'll explain later, Edgar did not love Boston, even though that city memorialized him recently in a life-size sculpture. After their mother's death, the three children were split up. 
Rosalie adopted by the Mackenzie family in Richmond. Henry was sent to his father's family in Baltimore. And Edgar was taken in by the Scots business and Ed, um, John Allen. And his wife, Frances, in Richmond. So Edgar had lost not only his mother, but also his siblings. On December 11th, 1811, a major fire destroyed the Richmond Theater, and it was rumored that his father, David Poe, was among the 72 victims of the fire. When John Allen, while John Allen was a well-to-do slaveholder and a strict disciplinarian, at first he treated little Edgar with generosity. Although the Allens had no children, it was said that John had fathered an illegitimate child, Edwin Collier, whose expenses John continued to pay. Edgar was baptized Edgar Allen in the Episcopal Church, but the Allens never formally adopted him. In 1850-15, when Edgar was six and a half, the family traveled to England where they remained for five years for business purposes. Not many details of Edgar's youth are known, but a retired Penn State professor, Dr. Richard Copley, is writing a new Poe biography using a large box of 19th century materials given to him some time ago. The documents include letters and journals relating to Poe's early life. In England, Edgar attended a boarding school where he continued his studies of Greek, Latin, French, and English, among other subjects, but apparently he fell ill from time to time. He was praised by his teachers for being intelligent, but strong-headed and spoiled. John Allen rarely mentions Edgar in his letters to relatives, but he notes that Fanny Allen frequently suffered, suffered ill health. Unfortunately, John Allen's tobacco business collapsed and the family returned to Richmond in August, 1820, where teachers and other adults praised Edgar's verse, written mostly to attractive Richmond girls. The family occupied an enormous estate, Moldavia, that was later willed to John Allen by his uncle. Edgar was raised as a well-educated Southern gentleman which influenced the content of his later writing. If, for example, you know, The Gold Bug. Fanny Allen told a friend that she loved Edgar like her own son, but her continuing illnesses interfered with their relationship. Poe saw another mother figure in the person of Jane Stannard, a, friend, um, a mother of a friend, but after a year, she died at age 31 in an insane asylum leaving Edgar bereft and depressed. John Allen felt he was being generous in a material sense and accused Edgar of ungratefulness and coldness. Nevertheless, just after his 17th birthday, Edgar enrolled at the University of Virginia, which had been established by Thomas Jefferson only the year previously. Edgar excelled in athletics and in all the language courses he undertook, but the very lax discipline of the campus, especially in contrast to John Allen's strictness, proved really bad for the young man. Over the course of the year, Edgar accumulated over $2,000 in gambling debts and expenses that John Allen refused to pay. After continuing to argue with his foster father over money, on March 24, 1827, Poe sailed to Boston. He falsely acclaimed that he was following his hero, Lord Byron, by going to help the Greeks in their war of independence from the Ottoman Empire. Poe seems to have wanted to escape the difficulties of reality by merging literary influence with his own life. In reality, what Poe did in May of 1827 was enlist, enlist in the U.S. Army for five years using the pseudonym of Edgar A. Poe. Uh, claiming he was 22 years old. In July of the same year, Calvin Thomas published 50 copies of Tamerlane and other poems by a Bostonian. Poe's name wasn't on it. 
Poe's preference stated that the greater part of the poems were written in the year 1820-21, when the author had not yet completed his 14th year. In October of 1827, Poe's battery was stationed at Fort Moultrie, Sullivan's Island, Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. If you've read The Gold Bug, you know that's the very island where the story takes place. After a year and a half of army life, Poe had had it, and he writes to John Allen that his colonel told him, quote, Richmond and the U.S. are too narrow a sphere, and the world shall be my theater, unquote. Surprisingly, Edgar requested Allen to use his connections to get his, him admitted to West Point. But tragedy struck again when on February 28th, 1829, Fanny Allen died following a lingering and painful illness. Edgar did not uh, arrive in Richmond until the night after her burial. Poe next moved to Baltimore, and though he received from financial support from Allen, he received a little income from publishing his poems. His big break came in December 1829 when the Baltimore publishers Hatch and Darning published Al Araf, Tamerlane, and other poems. That's it right there. The collection was widely re reviewed and criticized for its esoteric foreign references. Some modern critics have called it unintelligible. El Araf is based on Surah 7 of the Quran and refers to the place um, in the poem between heaven and hell where people lived until uh, they were given permission to ascend to heaven. Uh, they were awaiting God's permission to enter uh, paradise. The poem describes a dreamy refuge filled with ideal love and ideal beauty, topics that frequently occur in Poe's later work, but it was also criticized for its length, 422 lines, that perhaps convinced Poe thereafter to write much shorter poems. It's a mixture of angels, astronomy, literary tradition, especially Keats, and Orientalism combined with learned notes and footnotes that uh, led to mixed reviews. By mid-June the next year, 1830, Edgar found himself at West Point where the physical routine was rigorous, obviously, and he took and excelled in French and math. Poe amused his fellow cadets with wild and untrue stories about himself, saying, for example, he had been a sailor, he was the grandson of Benedict Arnold, he had visited South America. By that fall, Edward's long drawn out battles with John Allen came to an end when Allen married Louisa Patterson, a New York woman 20 years his junior. It was a double blow to Edgar as the marriage had taken place in New York City, not far from West Point, and Edgar was not even invited. It also meant the end of financial support for the foster son. Edgar then wrote to his um, earlier army substitute, accusing Allen of abuse and drunkenness. When this got back to Allen, that was the end. In self-destructive revenge, Poe neglected his duties at West Point and refused to obey orders. There were 106 conduct points against him. On January 18th, excuse me, 28th, 1831, he was court-martialed and dismissed from West Point. He left for New York, penniless and apparently coughing blood. To give him some relief, fellow cadets contributed over $200 to pay for the publication of a collection of Poe's poems. Mm -hmm. By May 6th, Poe returned to Baltimore to live with his aunt, Mariah Clem, and her daughter, Virginia, and other relatives. At this time, perhaps for financial reasons, Poe shifted his attention to writing fiction, focusing on short stories. He was getting widely reviewed as his poetry was published in various newspapers, usually without his permission. Since copyright laws did not exist at that time, Poe received no payment for any of these reprints. Again, tragedy struck on August 1, when Edgar's 
brother died of tuberculosis at age 24. But Ko was encouraged by publication of a number of his short stories, including Manuscript in a Bottle and Loss of Breath. By February 1834, Poe heard that his foster father was very ill. And when he tried to visit Moldavia, Alan's wife refused to admit him. Alan died the next month at age 54, leaving a lot of money and property, including nine slaves, to his wife and their three sons, as well as his illegitimate son, but not a penny to Edgar. With the hope of literary friends, Poe began publishing poetry and stories in the Southern Literary Messenger, a monthly magazine. Poe suggested to the owner that readers liked sensational stories, even to the point of bad taste. Think of his story, Berenice, a tale, where the lover extracts all the teeth of his dead cousin. These stories came from the European Gothic tradition, which included Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Poe moved back to Richmond in October 1835 with his aunt Mariah calling her Muddy because she was the sister of his mother and her daughter Virginia Clem. The following spring, Poe quietly married his cousin Virginia, who was barely 14 years old. Given her youth and Poe's idealization, of Virginia. Next slide. Scholars wondered endlessly whether or not the marriage was ever consummated. Poe and Virginia were publicly married in May of 1836 when witnesses swore she was 21 years old. Poe was now supporting three people, clearly on the edge of poverty. At the end of 1835, he tells a friend he had received nearly $800 for the year. In the Southern Literary Messenger, Poe published his own work and many book reviews. While Poe is praised for his wit and satire, he could be so rough in some of his reviews that he was known as the, quote, tomahawk man. Poe was paid at the rate of 80 cents per column. He saw the magazine as a symbol of the rise of Southern literary culture, sometimes even reviewing his own work, a 19th century practice that was called puffery. Poe ran into difficulties with the messenger's owner who belonged to the temperance movement when Poe appeared to be drunk on the job. At the same time, Poe was writing harsh and unjust reviews of several popular poets. At the same time, Poe, who loved solving mysteries, was figuring out coded cryptograms submitted by the messenger subscribers. By January 1836, Poe had, quote, retired as the editor of the Southern Literary Messenger and was working on his only novel, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. And by February, the family had moved to New York City. Maps of the city show Poe lived in four different places in Lower Manhattan. The, the last extent um, city house near Washington Square was mostly demolished in 2001 by NYU and one of their law school uh, expansions. Although the Poe Studies Association asked the NYU Poe biographer Ken Silverman to advocate for preservation, he refused, offering no clear explanation. After legal negotiations, a small portion of the facade was retained. Poe later lost editorship at Burton's Gentleman's Magazine and by the end of 1840 was bedridden with an unexplained illness. For some time then, Poe was unable to write much, but his novel, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, was finally published by Harper's. This long adventure story is a classic adventure tale with chapters entitled Massacre, mutiny and atrocious butchery, and shipwreck and subsequent horrible sufferings from famine. The novel's violence seems to reflect all the unhappy events of his own life. For example, two characters named Alan are put to death. During this period, Poe published his short story, Lygia, 
a wildly successful tale about a strong-willed woman who refuses to stay dead. Poe said in his essay that year, quote, the philosophy of composition, unquote, that, quote, the most poetical topic in the world was the death of a beautiful woman, end quote. This was certainly true for a lot of 19th century literature, theater, and certainly opera, where the woman dies a tragic death. But in Poe's stories, the woman refuses to stay dead. In his essay, Poe also spells out step by step how he constructed his poem, The Raven, starting at the end. The voice in the essay is calm and rational, unlike the crazy, unreliable narrators of some of Poe's tales, if you think of The Telltale Heart or The Black Cat. 1845 was a difficult year for Poe. He was depressed, fell out with his friends and business associations, um, all, always without money and frightened at Virginia's failing health. In February, Poe delivered a famous lecture at the New York Society Library in which he battered the poetry of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, accusing him of, long, of plagiarism, a trait that Poe himself was guilty of. In all, Poe published over 50 pages of criticism of Longfellow, saying his work was derived from Milton, Tennyson, Scott's Ballads, and others, most particularly from himself. Longfellow was very popular and was defended by many of his contemporary literary figures. The whole, fell, the whole affair was called the Longfellow War. Perhaps Poe was jealous of Longfellow's publishing success and as a, his identification with the Northern transcendentalists and abolitionists. In September, 1845, Poe's Goldbug and Mystery of Marie Roget and The Raven were published, extending his reputation across Europe, especially in France. The Raven and Other Poems was published in November, and the poem became a tremendous success. This is the text of The Raven. I'm sure you all know this, Once Upon a Midnight Dreary. A lot of people have recited this to me. It's a very long poem, even though Poe decided not to write two long poems, 14, 15. Poe later explained that he selected the raven as an emblem of what he called mournful and never ending remembrance, a good description of much that he wrote, a kind of despair and self torture. Poe was traveling to various cities, delivering talks on the poets and poetry of America and repeatedly reciting the raven, which he said he hated. Poe was invited to Boston to deliver a poem and on October 16th, 1845, following a two hour long political speech by someone else at the Boston Lyceum, Poe po rose to deliver his early poem, El Araf, which he now called the messenger star. Confused and annoyed, the audience left rather noisily in droves before the organizers requested Poe to recite The Raven. Poe later claimed that the Frog Pondlands, that is the Bostonians, were too, too, too stupid to understand a poem written by a mere boy. As I said earlier, modern Bostonians have forgiven Poe's abuse and in 2014 erected a life-size statue in the Edgar Allan Poe Square. Number 16, there it is, 17. In the spring of 1846, the Poes and Muddy moved to their final home, a rented cottage across from Fordham College, where Poe frequently went to use the library, chat and play cards with the French-speaking Jesuit priests. The house is still accessible today. Of course, it's not open at the current time. 16, there it is. By November of 1846, Virginia lay dying on a straw bed with Edgar's coat and a cat to keep her warm. In December, the Morning Express writes, quote, we regret to learn that Edgar A. Poe and his wife are both dangerously ill with the consumption and ask for public assistance. Several friends donated funds and one, Mary Louise Shue, bought Virginia's coffin and grave clothes and 
tended to her at Fordham until her death of pulmonary consumption on January 30th, 1847. She was 25. Following Virginia's death, Poe desperately sought female companionship. He actively courted two women, Jane Locke and Nancy Annie Virchman of Lowell, Massachusetts. He then took up a new romance with a third woman, Sarah Helen Whitman from Providence, Rhode Island. There she is. Known as Helen, she was rather well, um, a rather well-to-do published writer and critic. She translated German philosophy and perhaps surprisingly was very influenced by Emerson and the transcendentalists. Remember, they were abolitionists. An admirer of Edgar, she published a poem, quote, to Edgar A. Poe, unquote, in the summer of 1848. Poe responded with a poem, say he hoped they could be united in the next world. After a few more poetic exchanges, Poe traveled in the fall to Providence, and within two days, they were about to become uh, engaged. However, after eight days, Helen, influenced by the gossip of friends, wrote to Poe, breaking off the relationship and stating that, quote, his great, he has great intellectual power, but no principle, no moral sense, unquote. Seeking sympathy on November 2nd, Poe went to Pro Providence, bought two ounces of laudanum, an opium derivative, and took a train to Boston intending to die, quote, in the place of his birth and where his mother found her best and most sympathetic friends, unquote. He swallowed about an ounce of the laudanum, became very sick, and was rescued by an unidentified friend, and then taken to the home of Dr. Abraham Oakey, who diagnosed sim tim symptoms of what he called cerebral congestion. Returning to Fordham, Poe wrote impassioned letter letters to Annie Richmond, who was married, by the way, proposing that they live together in a humble little cottage. During Poe's last trip to Providence, Helen's mother, trying to prevent Poe's taking advantage, forced her to give up all her property. The chances of marriage were dead. Regarding blue stockings, that is intellectual women, Poe wrote to Annie, quote, from this day forth, I shun the potential society of literary women. They are heartless, unnatural, venomous, dishonorable with no guiding principle, but inordinate self-esteem, end quote. All through this period, Muddy observed that, quote, poor Eddie was not well at all. She doesn't say if it's physical or, or uh, emotional. After a two year hiatus, Poe published his poem, The Bells, the vengeful short story, um, Hop Frog, and his famous Annabelle Lee. Ken Silverman points out that this poem, as in his own life, Poe was, quote, celebrating a non-sexual childlike attachment, unquote, to a woman. Continuing his desperate search for female companionship, Poe traveled to Richmond in the fall of 1849 to propose marriage to a childhood friend, Elmira Shelton. On his return to New York, Poe somehow landed in Baltimore, and on election day, October 3rd, he was found on the street near a tavern, Gunner's Hall, being used as a polling place. He was disoriented and in a stranger's rumpled and dirty clothing. It was believed that he was a victim of what was called cooping, or the dishonest practice of changing clothing and using another name so that one could vote several times. If they were giving Poe alcohol, that would have in fact been very dangerous for Poe. Feverish and incoherent, he was taken to Washington College Hospital where he died on October 7th, 1849. No diagnosis was made and scholars have theorized endlessly about the cause of Poe's death. Poe's attending doctor, Dr. John J. Moran, noted to Muddy Clem that Poe was unconscious from 5 p.m. until 3 the next morning when he began, quote, active delirium, unquote, talking to the wall and sweating profusely. 
He said, Poe said, he wanted, quote, to blow out his brains with a pistol, end quote. That night, Poe repeatedly called for Reynolds, a childhood friend, and at 3 a.m. he said, Lord help my poor soul, and he expired. Over the next few days, many admirers came to cut a lock of Poe's hair, and he was buried in his grandfather's plot in the Presbyterian Cemetery at the corner of Fayette and Green. Next slide. Family members provided the coffin and hearse for the funeral. On October 9th, the Daily Tribune contained a long Poe obituary written by fellow author Rufus Griswold, but signed Ludwig. The announcement declares Poe's death, quote, will startle many, but few will be grieved by it. He was well known, but he had few friends or no friends. He was an unbalanced misanthrope who dwelt in ideal realms in heaven or hell, end quote. Griswold accused Poe of chronic drunkenness, and when newspapers in New York and Philadelphia reprinted the obit, they stated the cause of death was deliria tremens, a symptom of alcohol poisoning. Ironically, Poe had named his fellow, Rufus Griswold, as executor of his will. Since Dr. Moran made no definitive diagnosis suggesting, quote, brain congestion, unquote, scholars have ever since been guessing at what Poe's cause of death was. Besides alcoholism, writers have claimed acute alcohol poisoning, typhoid, cholera, epilepsy, diabetes, stroke, and malaria. But for me, the strangest two I've heard are uh, one given by an internist at Johns Hopkins who claimed the cause was rabies, also known as hydrophobia, that is fear of water, difficulty swallowing. But Dr. Moran stated that Poe was able to swallow water when he was conscious. There were no signs on Poe's body that he had been written by, bitten by a rabid animal. The second theory was proposed by a Canadian at a Poe conference in Richmond who insisted on a panel that Poe died of carbon monoxide poisoning from the gaslighting of that era. Challenged by my husband, Robert, who is a chemical engineer and Ken Silverman, chair of the panel, this man finally revealed that he was selling carbon monoxide detectors because we are all in danger. It seems to me the more obvious cause was tuberculosis. Given Poe's long-term exposure to the disease, poor nutrition and alcohol consumption, and the fact that he was chronically ill with fevers and bleeding from the lungs, TB could be a viable diagnosis. Remember his mother, his brother, Virginia, all died of TB. Without lab tests or x-rays, it's just a guess. Regarding alcoholism, two descendants of Poe's cousin Nelson, that is Harry and George Poe, who are currently alive, attest to a serious intolerance to alcohol. In any event, in spite of Griswold's horrible and influential obituary, we should remember Edgar Allan Poe's contributions to American and world literature as creator of detective fiction with um, Auguste Dupin in the Purloin Letter, his frequently mentioned The Raven and weird Gothic stories, which have been the inspiration of countless books, movie, movies, graphic novels, videos, and even operas. We owe him a great deal. Thank you. Show the next two, please. And this is the current site in Baltimore. His grave was moved a few years ago, closer to where the gate is to the cemetery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Koros. We'll now entertain questions. Mark, are you uh, take the questions? Well, I had my hand up, so I'll go okay. first. Okay. Uh, uh, Bill Tittle has his hand up. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, uh, 
uh, I won't say it was a light presentation, but it was a very informative <laughs> one. Um, <clears throat> it reinforces my hypothesis that a creative genius and neurosis uh, often go together. <laughs> but yet, uh, your your depiction was was he also was very um, uh, independent spirit. You know, he, he just wouldn't. Um, and that can also be a source. Well, what, what do you think? Well, what do you think of what I just said? You know, frankly, um, I, I have a, a background in psychiatric nursing. Frankly, these days, I don't know what the heck is normal. I really don't. You know, I mean, uh, through the years, certain things were identified by the American Medical Association, the Psychiatric uh, Association, as an illness like homosexuality. You know, I. I don't think that creativity is necessarily associated with neurosis. It may be that it's associated with people who are thinking outside the box and therefore could be viewed as somewhat odd. Um, but if the creative force results in something that contributes to civilization, that's okay with me. You know? I was trained in Freudian psychology, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Haas, you're next. You have to unmute yourself. Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now, you said the uh, background in psychiatry. Looking at some of the uh, post poetry, most of them seems to be on the darker side of life. Uh, it sounds like you know, it was a very disturbed man. If you look at the Raven, it's more about losing this, uh, what's her name, Lenore, and a dream within a dream. Everything is in the uh, never, never land kind of thing. And you know, in some of the contemporary poets, you know, they, not a poet, but uh, Somerset Mom, uh, they seem to have a, some sort of a cleaning their heart, and they try to experience that. So, and also, you know, the fact he married his cousin, she was uh, half his age. 26 was 13. So I just wanted to see your thoughts on his mental state and uh, what uh, drove it to uh, drove him to that. Drove him to the marriage? Yeah. Well, I think the now, marriage uh, and his whole psychological upbringing. Looking at all his books, you know, Dream in a Dream, and uh, he's got a book, I think, Lenore. I read a few of them earlier in my college days. So, majority of them are focus mostly on relationship with women. I don't know, maybe his relationship with his mother or uh, things like that. So, you know, just uh, playing a psychology 101. I just wanted to see your thoughts. Well, it, it's always a problem to psychoanalyze someone who cannot defend himself or herself. Uh, but given the tragedies in his life, I can understand why he saw the dark side of existence. Um, in the 19th century, uh, throughout Europe, though, there was a, an intensification of the interests, like Frankenstein, for example, um, of um, the dark side of human nature. And I don't know if that was um, a reaction to the Enlightenment with all of its glorification of our potential as human beings, you know, the intellectualism, uh, but I think um, there, there has always been a question, as I said, about whether the marriage with Virginia was ever consummated. There has always been a question about uh, Poe's sexuality. Um, a 14 year old um, would have been um, not a, an exact good match sexually as a partner. And I, we don't really know if they ever consummated it, but I have to say that many of the friends that Poe was um, very close to are known to have been gay uh, writers and reviewers and so forth. But, you know, um, I'm very anxious for the book that I mentioned by Richard Copley because he got this great big book of materials from um, fairly recently from someone in Richmond who can talk about um, Poe's intimate life as a young person. And I'm, I'm very anxious to see what 
he has to say. Perhaps he will say something about his sexuality. But um, Poe, by writing these things, got into this trend for what I call the Gothic, you know, the things about the, you know, it was a dark and rainy and uh, night, that sort of thing. It's very, very typical of the 19th century, but he carried it to an extreme. And sometimes um, in the vein of revenge, I mean, having two characters in the novel, uh, the um, Arthur Gordon Pym novel <laughs> killed with the name of his, his foster father who never saw fit to adopt him or leave him any money when he died. He was very well off. He never left him anything. I, I think he was mixing life and fiction. And the fact that he that mixture fed very well into the literary trends of the 19th century just seemed to produce literature what, which was being read by a great deal of the public, who was very, very successful in Europe, particularly in France, who just loved this dark and stormy night <laughs> stuff. You know. Thank you, and so, so. Okay, uh, Nolan, it's time for you. Okay, uh, two quick comments. One, we've just seen three presentations on the Beatles. To bring Edgar Allan Poe to the current day, and if the Beatles fans, in, in John Lennon's apocalyptic, I am the walrus, one of the final lines is, man, you should have seen them kicking Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> Many people will note that. I am the walrus. Cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> now to go another um, current events, as you all probably know, on Friday, Disney's gonna, Disney Plus is going to open Hamilton the movie. Disney owns ABC, so you can learn a lot about the uh, movie just by watching ABC. Good Morning America, every single day has a different cast member talking about the movie. Uh, yesterday was yeah. Aaron Burr. No, yesterday was Thomas Jefferson. Today yeah, uh, Nolan, could we stay on Edgar Allan Poe, please? I'm done. Okay. <laughs> uh, Bappy, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Last chance. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. Go ahead. Speak. The, what, in your opinion, is the best poetry you can? My wife has some specialty to her, Edgar Allan Poe. What, in your opinion, is the best poem that you wrote? Best, I'm sorry, I missed the last word. Poem. poem. Best poem. Best, best poem he wrote. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, well, I, I, the poem that I, I've written about is uh, Annabelle Lee, and uh, it, it's that same longing for the dead female companion. Um, I, I don't know about, I don't know what best is because um, it, different poems ap appeal to different sensibilities. And I, when I was teaching uh, Poe, I taught a poem uh, called Ode to Science, where he criticizes rationalism, that characteristic of scientific investigation as suppressing the creative spirit. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people have opposed those two, reason and creativity, you know, that uh, going back to a former point, yeah. uh, the, the neurosis and creativity, you know, that rationality doesn't go along with creativity. And, um, and he's, although in that poem, he's critiquing science for having that oppressive force, mm -hmm. he loved science. He really, he was interested in all kinds of inventions, uh, some of his stories talk about in, uh, creative um, machines, if you will. So I do like his uh, Ode to Science very much because it's at a very important point that is still alive, as we can tell from the comment, that um, tension between rationality and, and the creative spirit. Thank you. 
Uh, Herb Waddell, you have to unmute. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to make a comment. Poe appeals to little children. I found this as a grandparent. Mm. My wife had a routine. She would start telling a story with, it was a dark and stormy night. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you paint such a picture and you have the rhyme and the rhythm and it just appeals to well, everyone, but especially to little children. So I recommend you try it out on grandkids. <laughs> the real spooky stuff. But yes, we like to scare wow, ourselves. It's just so, so infectious. Everyone loves it. <laughs> yes, yes. It, it's an interesting human quality that we like to terrify ourselves, I guess because we think that we can come back to a safe place after that. But right now, reality is itself terrifying. So, yeah. Uh, Mitch, did, what, were you wanting to speak? Is that why you have a flag up? Yeah, I, I was just curious. Uh, as I heard you speak, I think you said that his father abandoned the family when he was something like three years old or something, anyways, as a young man yes. or a kid. Uh, and it occurs to me that in a lot of the different things that I've heard about that era and coming up even into the early 20th century, uh, fathers abandoning the family seem to be a fairly common theme. And fast forward to today, uh, and I don't know, our lifetimes, it doesn't seem to be very common anymore. Uh, I don't know if any you or anybody else has any you know, real data on that, but it just seems like abandonment of family by the father was something that happened in a lot in a lot of the westerns and so forth. Any comments? Okay, uh, Rich Jager is next. I just I just want. To oh, say, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I I know that in in my own investigation of my family that um, fathers frequently abandoned their family when their wife died and. Um, they would sometimes pawn them off on, if possible, other family members, or if not, someone who would take them in, and uh, sometimes would bring them back if they remarried. But it it was a very odd tie between fathers and their children in the 19th century. It's uh, it's frankly, it's very hard for me to understand. But it, there was a trend, as you said. Rich Jager. Um, I certainly enjoyed reading a number of his short stories like uh, The Mask of the Red Death and The, the Telltale Heart. What, what's the um, literary estimation uh, uh, of, of his short stories these days? Uh, you know, how, how would uh, today's critics uh, uh, write them in the uh, pantheon of uh, stories of English literature? Well, in American literature, they're they're rated very highly. Am I on? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, in American literature, they're rated very highly and they're always in, uh, the short stories are always in uh, anthologies, collections of American literature for teaching purposes. And um, I have to say that the Post Studies Association that I'm the um, treasurer of is um, has a very nice membership and people are enthusiastic and they're always in coming up with criticism about the short stories. Uh, I did a, myself an analysis of a couple of the short stories um, showing the influence of alchemy. Um, critics love the, the short stories. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm I want to make a a comment. It's not exactly a question, but I just want to mention that uh, some years ago I went to the Morgan Library and they had an exhibition of Poe's manuscripts. And he had this interesting way of writing uh, his manuscripts. He wrote them on a scroll, right. a vertical scroll of paper, right. a little bit like toilet paper, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I guess it was very convenient because he could cut out 
a piece and then paste in another piece. Yes. And keep the sequence. Yes. That, that's exactly what he did. He did a lot of cutting and pasting. Uh, okay, uh, Al, you're next. Uh, th thank you for a delightful talk. I've been actually a fan of Poe's writing since I was a little kid. But your comments about why do parents like to scare their children <laughs> with tales of horror and Poe is certainly an example, but fairy tales are even worse. Yeah. <laughs> it's to keep kids in line. <laughs> That's a well-known uh, criticism of uh, children's fairy tales. It's to keep kids in line. This is a moral lesson. It, that, that, among the critics of children's literature, that, that's a predominant uh, theory. Uh, okay, I don't see any more hands raised. Uh, is there anyone who would like to cut in and unmute themselves and make any remarks on this topic? Hey, this is Fred Honnold. I have a question here. And just FYI, I do not see a blue hand, otherwise I would have raised it sooner. Excellent talk. And follow up to the uh, comment about his uh, approach with scrolls. How would Poe go about writing his works? Was it a lot of rewrites? Where would he do it? For example, I heard Twain would be on his third floor at a corner desk, and that's where he did some of his great works without anything interfering. So how would Poe get his inspiration how would he write? How would he produce? Well, uh, the script that was a continuous piece of paper was a very unusual um, setup. He usually wrote on individual leaves. Uh, paper was very expensive, and he frequently used um, paper that had been used for something else, and he wrote on the reverse side. But um, he was generally writing in seclusion when he could, but if he was at home, for example, um, especially during Virginia's illness, it's hard for me that, that if you've ever been to that place on um, across from Ford and it's very tiny, that house, uh, he must have been very close to where she was di slowly dying of, of TB. So um, no one has actually ever analyzed precisely how he disconnected his mind, at least temporarily, from the sound and the fury, so to speak, that was going on around him to write these stories. He could write them fairly quickly, except when he was depressed. He could, he could turn out, I think he was um, cooking up the story in his head before he actually set pen to paper. Because um, many of the things that we have scripts for don't show a lot of corrections. So he had already formulated it mentally, which is an incredible way to write. Oh, oh boy. Uh, if there are no more questions. Uh, yeah, I, I apologize, but I, I muted uh, Fred when I shouldn't have. Fred, did you have something in reply that you wanted to say? And just a related follow on to the answer. Thank you for that. Did Poe write during a certain type, time of day? It doesn't seem like these uh, works of his get inspired during the daylight. Would he get uh, alive in his writing from midnight on? <laughs> well, there was only candlelight available, so, and, and later gaslight, but um, I, I don't really know what time of day he was writing. Thank you. Uh, we don't hear, I don't see any other questions at this time. Well, then I would like to thank uh, Professor Koros for a tre really tremendous presentation. Our old guard uh, has been around since 1930, and you are the latest of a distinguished line of lecturers. And we uh, want to um, express our gratitude with our old guard salute.
which is the floor is for all our members. Thank you very much.